I'm standing here on one of the battlefields of the First World War near the village of Vimy in northern France, about eight miles north of Arras. History and nature, as you can see, have partly covered up what happened here over 70 years ago. Then it looked something like this. Barbed wire defenses, trenches, craters, mud and gun smoke, charred trees, tanks, and soldiers going over the top. At the outbreak of war, the hostile armies faced each other along this line, implementing their famous Schlieffen plan. The Germans at first made rapid advances, but they were soon stopped by the Allies. By 1916, the front had stabilized roughly along this line, with embattled Vimy about here. The First World War was the first total war in modern history. Above all, it was the first industrial war. Those soldiers whom you saw going over the top a moment ago went straight into the fire of the enemy machine guns. Those symbols of industrialized warfare. Nobody knows how many men were killed or mutilated here. All we have is nameless tombstones and casualty figures like these. none of these soldiers would have boarded the trains to the front so happily if they had known what was awaiting them. The Germans know the hour of glory is at hand. But they were all blissfully ignorant of the actual nature of industrial warfare. They thought it would be another 1870 type war. They believed they would be home again by Christmas. The second reason for this widespread popular optimism was that soldiers on all sides thought they were going off to defend their country. It is doubtful if people would have joined up so enthusiastically for a war which they knew their leaders had launched with aggressive intentions. Historians have the benefit of hindsight. They have studied in detail the once secret files in search of those who actually started the First World War. To be sure, it was not the masses, but the top decision makers. But who were they? Was it the Tsar of Russia, whom you just saw inspecting his troops? Or was it the German Kaiser and his advisors? To discuss these and other questions relating to the origins of the First World War, I went to Hamburg in West Germany to see Professor Fritz Fischer. It is no exaggeration to say that no other recent historian has done more to promote research in this area. Above all, it was he who in the 1960s unleashed a major debate which is still rumbling on. I asked him whom he would hold primarily responsible for pushing Europe over the brink into a catastrophic war. I think all great powers who were participating in this war were, to some extent, responsible for its outbreak. But, in my judgment, Germany bears the greatest part of the responsibility. But what about the Russian mobilization order, Professor Fischer? I think this was very late in the crisis, uh, when the Russian mobilization came, and uh, Germany knew that for Russia, Mobilization did not mean war immediately, whereas in Germany, mobilization meant war. Now to Fischer, 
Germany meant the top decision makers. It meant the German military, but also the Kaiser and his civilian government. It was these men, he feels, who escalated the crisis of July 1914 into a major confrontation. Above all, it was these men who had been preparing for this confrontation ever since the notorious War Council of December 1912. Certainly, Fischer would attach a crucial importance to this meeting. To understand his argument, we must first take a look at the map of pre-1914 Europe. International tensions had been rising well before 1912. The great powers had regrouped into two large armed camps, the Triple Entente and the Dual Alliance, with Italy as the unreliable partner of the latter. But by 1912, the Balkans had become the main flashpoint of international politics. Over the years, Turkey's hold on her European territories had been weakening in the face of a rising movement for independence among her Slav subjects. Their aspirations were promoted by Russia, who, after her defeat by Japan in 1905, had once again turned her attention to Europe. In October 1912, war broke out between the Turkish Empire and the Balkan League, made up of Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece, and Montenegro. The Balkan League won a swift victory against the Ottoman Empire. The strategic balance of power had shifted decisively in favor of the smaller Slav states, above all Serbia. Turkey had virtually been pushed out of Europe. More than ever, Austria-Hungary the other multinational empire in the region was now in the firing line of Slav independence movements and the leadership ambitions of Serbia. The weakened position of the central powers in the Balkans began to worry the Austrian and German general staffs. When it became clear that any attempt to curb Serbia would lead to a major conflict, the Kaiser concluded that the hour of decision had come. It is a matter of life and death for Germany, he said. The eventual struggle for existence, which the Germans will have to fight in Europe against the Slavs, supported by the Gauls, will find the Anglo-Saxons on the side of the Slavs. By Slavs, he meant, of course, also the Russians, thus effectively visualizing a world war. It is against this background that the Kaiser convened the above-mentioned War Council of the 8th of December 1912. It was, in fact, at this meeting, at least according to Fischer, that the decisive step was taken in favor of launching a major war 18 months later. He was so angry that he called his military advisors from naval and army and demanded them to begin immediately a war against England and France. But uh, on the other hand, uh, Admiral von Müller, the chief of the naval cabinet, recorded that uh, the results of the meeting were, I quote him, pretty much nil. Yeah, this pretty much nil is only related to the fact that the Kaiser uh, did not uh, push through this, his demand. Whereas Tirpitz, chief of the, um, um, uh, of the um, uh, navy, uh, gives to... Uh, protested and said, no, uh, the harbor for U-boats at Heligolands must be finished, and uh, the deepening of the King Canal uh, for using it for the dreadnoughts to uh, transfer German Navy between uh, the Baltic Sea and North Sea must be finished. And this in reality was uh, not done before the 23rd uh, of June 1914. So he asked for one and a half year uh, Postponement. postponement of this war. And in, in, uh, under this uh, uh, statement, the Kaiser gave up. But this was not the uh, real outcome of the war, in the, of the War Council. In this War Council, the Reich Chancellor and the Foreign Minister were not invited. But we know that the Kaiser 
who uh, was very mm, mm, angry and were interested on these questions for weeks and weeks, uh, could report that now the Reich's Chancellor uh, has uh, acquainted themselves with the idea of war. The Reich's Chancellor acted immediately the day after uh, the World Council, the Kaiser, um, uh, called the uh, Russian War Ministry and asked for the proposition for a great uh, enlargement of the German army. Now, other historians have disputed that the Kaiser began to prepare in cold blood the First World War some 18 months before it actually started. They would refer to the British War Minister, Lord Haldane, who said on one occasion that he was struck by Germany being a well-ordered society, but the more you got to the top, the more chaos there was in the decision-making process. I would not uh, agree with the um, Haldane's statement. This was his experience of the days in February 1912 as the Kaiser interprets uh, push through the enlargement of the Navy against the advice of the Chancellor. But in reality, uh, Germany was not in chaos. But, but it was that shows in my book, uh, The War of Illusions, uh, a way step by step which led nearer to the war. Uh, because in the, in the, after the end of the Balkan Wars, uh, there came new conflicts. Which... On this latter point, Professor Fischer and his critics have indeed moved more closely together. Conflict and tensions in the area did not end after the First Balkan War. The members of the Balkan League began to quarrel among themselves. In the summer of 1913, Serbia won another military victory, this time against Bulgaria, as a result of which she doubled her territory. Almost inevitably, Serbia's success led to a further deterioration of the Austro-Hungarian and German position in the Balkans. So, let us not be deceived by these pictures of the Austrian Emperor. By this wedding party, which Francis Joseph attended together with his son, the Archduke Ferdinand and his wife, soon to be assassinated at Sarajevo. The hardliners in Berlin and Vienna believed that the dual monarchy was doomed unless there was determined action to restore its international position. From now on, the leaders in Berlin and Vienna grew more and more gloomy about the future. Count Berchtold, the Austro-Hungarian foreign minister, recorded in his diary that the dual monarchy stood at the crossroads and was now struggling for its survival. In Berlin, the Kaiser and his advisers felt they must help Austria-Hungary, and some even wanted Germany to take a lead. Reviewing the situation in Berlin, Professor Fischer states. So in the December 1913, in January 1914, uh, there are a lot of testimonies that the Reich Chancellor himself regarded war, the great war, uh, with France and Russia as inevitable. No doubt the German Chancellor was getting worried about the domestic situation. The Social Democrats had become the largest party in Parliament. Meanwhile, the extreme right was also getting organised, clamouring for government action against the left at home and against Germany's enemies abroad. Given this increasingly dangerous domestic and external situation of the two Central European monarchies, the small town of Sarajevo suddenly became the centre of world attention. On the 28th of June 1914, Archduke Ferdinand and his wife paid an official visit to Sarajevo in Bosnia, which the Austrians had annexed in 1908 against the will of Russia, the protector and promoter of Slav nationalism. With the support of the nationalist underground and perhaps even of the Serbian secret service, these men plotted to kill the Archduke as the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne. Their first attempt failed, but they caught the Archduke's car on its way back from the town hall reception. The driver of the car Apprised of the first attempt, but confused by fresh instructions about the route, took a wrong turning on the corner 
across this bridge. Shots were fired. There was pandemonium. The assassin was arrested. But the Archduke and his wife died from their wounds. I asked Professor Fisher if Sarajevo was the cause of the world war that broke out a few weeks later. Or was it merely the trigger? Uh, the, the assassination of the Archduke of Hans Ferdinand was not the cause of the war, but as you call it, a trigger. But a trigger for what? A limited war or a world war? Over this point, historians have continued to disagree. Some, like the American historian Konrad Jarausch, have argued that the Central Powers did not want more than a limited war in the Balkans. Serbia was to be punished for her alleged complicity in the Sarajevo murders. A military success by Austria-Hungary over Serbia would stabilize the situation in the Balkans. The other great powers would be faced with a fait accompli and accept it. Austria-Hungary and Germany would have won a great diplomatic triumph. Professor Fischer, as we have seen, disagrees. According to him, Sarajevo was the trigger of a major war, a settling of accounts which the Kaiser and his advisers, German Foreign Minister Gottlieb von Jager among them, had been preparing for for some time. We know that Jago was one of the first who uh, uh, was uh, in favor to use the murder of the Archduke for the possibility of a preventive war. But uh, he asserted that he was never in principle uh, at, uh, against a preventive war. And I quote him, he says, if war appears inevitable, uh, one must not allow the enemy to dictate the moment, but determine it oneself. Whatever the initial strategy of the German chancellor and his foreign minister, it was dependent on swift and effective action by these gentlemen sitting around this table in Vienna. And this is what the Kaiser and his civilian advisers tried to engineer. The German emperor, prepared by these ideas, uh, immediately saw that uh, there should be an action, a military action against Serbia, and he encouraged uh, Austria to do so. And uh, under this invitation, uh, the Austrian government decided to prepare such a uh, military action by this famous ultimatum. While Europe was outwardly calm and enjoying the summer, Vienna took a long time to finalize the ultimatum. Count Tisha, the Hungarian prime minister, was fearful of a possible Russian intervention and kept on raising tactical points. It was also discovered that about half the army in the eastern region had been granted leave to help gather in the harvest Recalling the soldiers before their leave expired by the 25th of July would have aroused suspicion abroad. The ultimatum was finally handed to the Serbian Deputy Prime Minister on the 23rd of July, almost four weeks after the Sarajevo murders. It quickly became clear that Russia would not allow Serbia to be humiliated. The Tsarist Foreign Minister Zazonov immediately suspected that Vienna with German support, was aiming at, I quote, the total annihilation of Serbia and the disturbance of the political equilibrium in the Balkans. And so a chain reaction was set in motion. Serbia, assured of Russian backing, rejected the Austro-Hungarian ultimatum. On the 28th of July, Austria-Hungary declared war on Belgrade. A major war was now only a few days away. There were a number of last-minute attempts to de-escalate the crisis. But the generals were by now determinedly pushing for a major war. The German chancellor merely saw it as his main task to create domestic conditions which would enable the central powers to enter the great conflict under the most favorable terms. Among his maneuvers was a successful attempt to persuade the socialists that Germany was merely responding defensively to Russian aggression. Hence, the importance 
of the Russian mobilization order published before the German one. As Admiral von Miller, the chief of the naval cabinet, recorded in his diary on the 1st of August, brilliant mood. The government has succeeded very well in making us appear as the attacked. I am therefore back to the point I tried to make at the beginning of my analysis. This was certainly the impression which these soldiers and civilians had when they entered the Great War. And their patriotism probably also made it easier for them to accept, at least initially, the horrors of mechanized warfare. But as I stand here under this monument on Vimy Battlefield, let me raise one final question. I really wonder whether mass enthusiasm was as great as it is usually described in the history books. Historical debate has very largely focused on the decision-making at the top. Surprisingly few studies have been undertaken about popular feeling in July, August 1914. The French historian Jean-Jacques Becker, evaluating materials from some French regions, found that there were tears and consternation when the French mobilization order was proclaimed. Fisher was among the first to discover that peace demonstrations took place in various German cities after the publication of the ultimatum, designed to warn Austria-Hungary against a further escalation of the crisis. And after the publication of the German mobilization, the local press in the city of Hamburg in North Germany reported that the news was received in, I quote, silent earnestness. Hamburgian workers assembled in front of these trade union offices. And as one of them recorded in his diary, I quote, we watched the commotion rather dumbfounded. Many asked themselves, am I mad or is it the others? Such documents raise serious questions about the extent of popular enthusiasm. They also raise questions about the feelings with which these German soldiers move to the front through these shattered streets of Louvain in innocent Belgium, or along these mud tracks to their deaths in the trenches. on firmer ground when we come to the decision-making processes and the responsibility of the key people. Most historians would agree with Fisher today that the major share of the responsibility for the outbreak of war in 1914 must go to the top politicians and generals in Berlin and Vienna. The debate continues about the motives of these men and the strategy which they pursued in 1914. I would like you to engage yourselves with this debate. Would you agree with Fisher? Or do you feel that the central powers pursued a more limited strategy that went badly wrong? There are plenty of books and published documents on the subject which you can study and discuss in detail. What you will find in them are amazing illusions and miscalculations. And occasionally, you will also find in them very perceptive assessments of the dangers of the situation, political wisdom and even humanity. The depressing thing is that these failed to assert themselves in 1914.